By the way, I got COVID this week. Three weeks ago, I made a whole video advising Microsoft on how to keep their upcoming showcase not awkward in light of recent closures of beloved studios. I suggested that the three top decision makers should maybe sit this one out. Well, the showcase happened, and no, said the Xbox executives, we won't be sitting this one out. In fact, we're going to be the only human faces you see in our entire showcase. Minus the stupid Call of Duty thing at the end. We are going to grin and gesture and stand like this in our half-zipped leather jackets, and you know what? People are going to love it. So apparently, they made the right call. And I'm not even mad about it. At this point, I just have to admire their corporate audacity, because it's not even like act like nothing happened. It's act like everything is better than ever. Look at the difference between Phil Spencer's performance last year and this year. Today is a special day for me and the team. I'm excited to see 11 games showcased from our first party studios. I'm incredibly excited for today's show. I'm standing here thinking about all the passion that has gone in to making this show what it is. He finally got his thumb out of his pocket. And for most viewers, there was no awkwardness to be had as Xbox put on, undeniably, the best showcase of the E3 season. And in fact, some budding journalists would even call it the best showcase Xbox had ever done. Now you could say Xbox is simply winning by default, because no one else can match their scale and breadth, and Summer Game Fest has to serve commercial interests by its very nature. You fight monsters, collect lots of shiny things. But I think that would be selling short just how well-designed these showcases actually are. I think even if Nintendo and Sony were trying, if they truly cared to win during this E3 season, I think they would still have a hard time beating these shows. Because I feel like there's someone behind them who is just like crafting a playlist. Someone behind these has a sense of rhythm and the strengths and weaknesses of each of their premieres. Look at this image. You think, wow, they really pulled something off this year. What an achievement. Look at this image. They won E3 last year too. I mean, they had me at Starfield. Remember this one? Man, Xbox really won E3 that year. But hold on, I'm getting sarcastic. Let's go back to 2024. Because I think when you look at this, you do get a sense of a playlist, right? And what I'm saying is that like each trailer doesn't have a particular value, but a spread of values. So here's how I'm going to explain it. With a, a JoJo-style stat pentagon. And yeah, technically JoJo characters have six points, but I have five. But what I find in assembling the super team, assembling the playlist, is that there are many games that, you know, just to kind of excel in one of these five points, and they appear exactly in the showcase when they are needed. So on top is the good games stat. Now you would think good games is like the most important part of this show, but sometimes good games have bad trailers. And you're asking me, what good game had a bad trailer? And I would say Call of Duty Black Ops 6. Absolutely unremarkable trailer, surprisingly boring deep dive which mostly only felt like teases for more deep dives to come. We know how many of our players look forward to multiplayer and we will be providing a deep dive on it later in the year. Be on the lookout for more intel coming later this year. So make sure to mark your calendars for our worldwide multiplayer reveal event at Call of Duty Next. There is so much more to share across all three game modes. Am I allowed to talk about Warzone yet? No. And it kind of played out like I guessed. They didn't win E3 with that Call of Duty demonstration, but it did help in a way. None of this blew people away at a classic E3 scale, but it added to the credibility of the showcase. And I think Avowed is a good game that keeps getting bad trailers. These shots are just terrible. Who selected these? And I keep thinking back to this one awkwardly framed shot where your character is vaulting over this short ledge. Why did they put that there? Really though, why did they put that there? Then of course there's the good trailer stat. Now this is a rude thing to say, but sometimes games make better trailers than video games. Microsoft Flight Simulator. Look, I know, I know this game reviews extremely well. I know it's an extraordinarily well-received game. 
But what I'm saying is that the trailers are extraordinary. They're way better than they have any right to be. Me, as someone who has no interest in an authentic recreation of what it feels like to be an aviator, I find it int- I like looking at it. I like the cinematography. I think they're excellent trailers. Mixtape might become one of these. It's hard to say at this point because there wasn't shown much of that game. It's an excellent trailer. The trailer moves you. But at the same time, Helping three teenagers have the summer of their lives, to me, is not a compelling video game concept. This year, I want to ride a flaming stallion of delinquency. All right, so then there's the prestige stat. So sometimes it's not even the case that the trailer is particularly good or the video game looks particularly fun. It's just the presence of a franchise that impacts the audience. Perfect Dark is back. Now, I don't think any part of this gameplay demo looks that fun or unique. And I don't think this trailer conveys an appealing or even coherent story. There's a teaser at the end with this glowing orb in the jungle. Nobody's intrigued. Nobody gives a shit about that glowing orb, but it just kind of is plopped into the part of a trailer where a teaser should be. (laughs) It's serving the purpose without actually fulfilling the need. But the reason that trailer was meaningful is that it is Perfect Dark, which we thought was in development hell, but look, it's here. It's real. Joanna Dark is real again. I'd say Prestige was also Gears of War E-Day's strongest stat, where the most significant part of this trailer is that your favorite characters are back. It's just like any live show. These showcases feel more like an event when the important people show up. That's that's just human nature. We love a red carpet. All right, next is the surprise stat. Truthfully, there were not a lot of big surprises coming out of the showcase in that, you know, there's, there's not that big AAA first party announcement coming out of nowhere. Nothing on that scale. Those are hard to come by these days. But I wouldn't say the show was without surprises. Think about Claire Obscure Expedition 33. Here's a goofy, sad France game you've never seen before. Okay. But then, oh, look at this. It's a turn-based RPG. Neat. I think moments like those make the showcase more exciting. It's more fun to be there live when unexpected things are happening. And finally, the variety stat. Consider Winterboro. I don't think this game would have necessarily stood out in a cozy, humble indie showcase. There doesn't seem to be anything innovative or especially exciting about it, but in the context of this Xbox showcase, it provides variety. It too is an essential part of the playlist. Nancy, finally! No! Question, am I being too mean to the mouse game? If, like, it's just, it's the COVID talking. I'm not me right now. I'm sorry, little mouse. So, statistically speaking, what do I think is the strongest trailer of the show? Doom the Dark Ages. There's one tip that I think a lot of video game trailers could benefit from, and that's just escalate, escalate, escalate. Like, figure out what are the coolest things you're willing to show to us today, right? List them, and then sort it. Make sure that you save the coolest things for last. Keep your trailer escalating. Now, like, you can't do a straight line for every trailer. And in fact, I think, like, the, my favorite trailers, it's more like, it's more, it's more like just like, uh, slowing down and then bursting through a level of understanding and then bursting through another one. It's basically how it feels to watch the second Super Mario Odyssey trailer. It's one of my favorite of all time. It feels like listening to the Daft Punk song Contact, where you like, you're here and you're like, I can't believe this song is still going. And it's like, oh, it's still going, you know? And it's like, oh, it's still going. Doom the Dark Ages does indeed escalate, escalate, escalate. And in terms of its value to the Xbox showcase, fills up nearly in the entire JoJo Pentagon. So as long as the team who puts these together remains dedicated and motivated and supported. I have no reason to think that Xbox will not continue to win E3 for many years to come. Now, do I think that this suggests a dramatic change and rejuvenation in the Xbox brand? No, they do this every year, but it's still a fun showcase to watch. 
and that is delayed input for this week. I'll be back next week. Until then, thanks for watching. A uh, common and probably fair criticism that I receive a lot is that I can tend to be a bit nitpicky in that I can fixate on a small thing that should be irrelevant and allow that to ruin what is generally a nice piece of art. However, it's after the credits, and I was almost genuinely nice to Xbox for this entire episode. So here are my two nitpickiest nitpicks from the Xbox showcase. Number one, that Indiana Jones cutscene deserves an F. All right, let's start with Gina. Gina previously in this very scene did a clever sleight of hand trick to fool this Nazi into accepting a live grenade. That's some fun Indiana Jones stuff. That's not a nitpick. I actually like that. However, seconds later, she slips and fucking tosses the stone that is essential to their journey. And you see both of her hands being open in the previous shot. So it means that sometime between that point and her fucking slipping and tossing it, she chose to take it out of her pocket and put it in her hand. So Indy and the Nazi dive onto the stone. Indy gets it first. He thinks the safest thing to do with it is just to flick it back to Gina. Fortunately, she catches it. It's not until this point that this other masked Nazi starts shooting his machine gun off screen. We have to assume Gina is dead now. Cut to this disorienting shot. Gina not only got cover, but she's hunched over like she's hiding. Like that guy couldn't have possibly seen her go behind a box or something. Cut 180 degrees the other way. Gina's cover slides because the ship is tipping, but then here comes another box. Cut 90 degrees to watch this hapless Nazi slowly skid towards Indy and the main Nazi. By the way, it's not clear in this shot where the first box even went. All right, so as you can see back there, Indy and the Choo Choo Nazi are brawling. We get another shot of this just zoomed in. Indy on the left, Choo Choo on the right. They kind of spin, but then we get this zoomed in shot where Indy is still on the left and Choo Choo still on the right. They both suddenly hear the slow moving box at the same time. Cut to this weird angle. Indy's on the right now just to keep you super disoriented. They stop fighting. That guy falls to his death. And then Indy and Choo Choo look at each other like that was crazy. And then Indy takes advantage of Choo Choo's extremely slow reaction times to punch him and shove him to his death. And then maybe Indy slips off that same ledge, we don't know, until the game comes out later this year. Yeah! Alright, so here's the thing. That, that whole sequence just sucks. It plainly sucks. Mathematically, fundamentally, it is poorly shot and directed. And it just like, it actually like bothers me to see comments where it's like, this feels just like a classic indie where it's like, I look, obviously I have no reverence for old Indiana Jones movies. I, I don't, I'm not one of those people who just like love Spielberg. Right. But I know he could have at least directed a competent action sequence. He gets how to do that. <laughs> it's like, this is not that. And yeah, it's not me like playing the whole game and everybody check this part out. Right. Xbox chose this particular scene as a demonstration of why this game will be good. Instead of even showing the game, they wanted to show this particular cutscene. This will convince everybody that we're on the right track with this one. And for many people, it just works. For many people, they just watch that scene and say, yup, that's my indie. It drives me, it drives, I feel so crazy. <laughs> and nitpick two. Marcus Phoenix's beloved bandana. So there's a dark moment in the E-Day trailer when Marcus Phoenix gets pushed into the ceiling and his iconic bandana falls off. It has a happy ending though. Watch again. Here's what happens. So while you're distracted by the notes of Mad World being played on a piano, Maybe you're not realizing how stupid that is. Here's what this means. Dom walked into that room. And the first thing he did was pick up the bandana off the floor. <laughs> then he thought, oh, I should look over the ledge. And he sees his friend Marcus Phoenix hanging by a pipe just in the nick of time. He grabs Marcus Phoenix's hands, pulled him up, and immediately takes that bandana out of his pocket, 
hands it to Marcus Phoenix, who then immediately, wordlessly puts it on. And I, maybe there's a theory that Dom just says spare bandanas because he knows how meaningful they are to Marcus Phoenix. And here's what's actually dumb. That's dumb, right? But I'm the dumb one because I was wondering, maybe the bandana means more than I think it does. I was checking the Gears of War wiki pages just to see if like, is the bandana, like, does it mean something? I did find this post on Reddit though, in which Officer Skitty explains that in the Gears of War book, Marcus had taken one line of the COG uniform code to heart. A do-rag was acceptable headgear as long as it was plain black, the ties were tucked away, and the cap badge was pinned centrally. So the in-canon reason here is that Marcus Phoenix just abides by this one particular regulation, and Dom knows that. He knows how important it is to Marcus Phoenix. He's like, here, I know you don't like breaking that one rule that all of the rest of us break all the time. Also, in overanalyzing this trailer in slow motion, I must say, that is no do-rag. It's a bandana. He's got hairs poking out the back. That is not regulation, Marcus. 